thank you to all of you for coming for this session, especially because it's all post-lunch sessions are really like difficult to deal with. So thank you for being here. Uh, welcome, Marissa. Uh, very glad to be in conversation with her. I've admired her work for a long time. But just to give like a brief uh, idea about what the Larry Nasser investigation is all about. Uh, in March 2016, Indie Star, where Marisa works, Indie Star began investigating USA Gymnastics, one of America's most prominent youth sports organizations, and the governing body for the US Olympic team. The investigation, the investigation known as Out of Balance revealed that USA Gymnastics has followed a policy of not reporting all sexual abuse allegations against its coaches. That practice has enabled coaches to continue preying on children despite repeated warnings. And uh, Indie Star also has revealed a culture within the gymnastics community that has allowed coaches to shift from gym to gym, again, despite warnings of inappropriate behavior. The investigation also provided the first comprehensive look at the pervasiveness of the problem, and mind you, this is really big, which revealed that at least 368 gymnasts have alleged sexual abuse over the past 20 years, so that's a big number to reach. So Indistar also brought to light accusations of sexual abuse by the former team doctor of USA Gymnastics, which is Larry Nasser. That doctor has since been arrested on charges of criminal sexual conduct and child pornography. So Marissa, thank you, and uh, we look forward to how you went about investigating th this case. First, tell us what is US gymnastics and how, how influential a body it is, what role does it play, and how difficult it is to penetrate a body like that. So USA Gymnastics, as you mentioned earlier, is the national governing body for the sport of gymnastics in the US. So they are the ones who have the Olympic team. They also, in order to be able to make the Olympic team, they control the competitions, they control the pathway. So for more than 100,000 gymnasts who are trying to reach that Olympic dream, that is the way you get there. And um, I, I'm not sure how the laws work here, but in the United States, USA Gymnastics is a nonprofit, which means that not all of the information about the way they operate is available. There are 990s that show certain information, but it's really difficult to get access to what's happening. And is it an influential body? Like, uh, is it difficult to penetrate in the sense that, in terms of access, because there are people high up there in the ladder and in the hierarchy? There's, for many years, been a culture of fear and silence. Not so much in the way of a government bureaucracy, but in the way that the gymnasts and those involved with the sport want the Olympic dream. That's what they're striving for. And speaking out could put that dream in danger because of the subjectivity of the sport and the judging process. Right. So how did you get leads into the story? How did you come across people? How did you manage to get testimonies and gather all that information together about this something that has been happening and to get to the details of 368 people actually complaining in the last 20 years? How did you manage that? So we started by getting an initial tip about a lawsuit in Georgia that involved a predatory coach who'd moved from gym to gym to gym despite warning signs about his conduct. And I had actually been doing an investigation into failures to report sexual abuse at that time when somebody told me about this lawsuit. And when I flew to Georgia, I picked up almost a 1,000 pages of records. And in those records, it talked about, in depositions, USA Gymnastics policy for handling sexual abuse allegations. And in those depositions, the officials themselves said that they would receive allegations and sometimes just put them in a file drawer. They wouldn't report them to police as required by law in most states in the US. They would not, um, in some cases, even investigate them further, that they would just file them away. And so. It became really important. We understood what the policy was, and we needed to understand the impact of that policy on the safety of kids in the sport. So from there, we started pulling access to court records and police records and interviewing as many people as we could to really understand the scope of the problem. And when you mentioned that 368 number, that was a later piece that we did. And by the way, that number is over 500 now. Um, but at the time, that was how many gymnasts had alleged some form of sexual abuse against a coach or somebody involved with the sport of gymnastics over a 20-year period. Now, in the Larry Nasser case, there's more than 330 people who have alleged sexual abuse against just him, the doctor alone. So 
obviously that number is much higher now. So was it difficult to go and actually get the survivors to talk to you? Because it's just like just going to someone and convincing them to share their story, which is often traumatic for them to talk about, or just spending enough time for them to be able to feel comfortable enough to share what they have gone through. How was that process? How, how did you do that? Interestingly, we actually did not have a lot of trouble in this particular investigation with convincing people to talk to us. But in general, when I do these types of stories, I'm always approaching the interview the same way. So I start by first explaining what I'm working on and why I want to talk to them. And giving them an opportunity as well to ask questions about what I'm working on, alleviate any concerns that they might have, so that before I ask a single question, they kind of know what they can expect, what is going to be happening over the course of the interview. And then we also made a point to, even after the interview is over, to keep in contact and let people know when the story might be coming out and when they could expect things to be happening so that there were no surprises. So how, uh, could you, would you like to share some testimonies of the people you spoke to, the survivors, what kind, to give us like a sense of what kind of things were happening and what did they oppose, how did they complain, was it addressed at all or not? When we're interviewing the survivors, especially when you're talking about abuse in the sport of gymnastics, it's really important for people to understand that this was not the slip of a hand during a spotting maneuver or an accidental touch, that it was a deliberate act and it was deliberately abuse. And so, in this particular investigation, we were much more explicit in our use of language than we might traditionally be in a story about a topic like this. And that was a decision that we made with our editors because we thought it was really important that, again, people understand that this is not an accident and these accusations are not just somebody misunderstanding what's going on during a training session, that it is truly abuse. And so. Um, we would have people giving incredibly explicit accounts about where the person's hands would be and how they would operate and how often it would happen, who was around, what was going on. And that became particularly important as we were investigating Larry Nasser because he was a doctor and he would abuse, as he's pleaded guilty to, he would abuse gymnasts under the guise of medical treatment. So he would claim that he was helping them with back problems or hip problems but in fact, he was sexually abusing them. So uh, were there like specific, apart from Larry Nasser, like in the investigation you've mentioned that there are several coaches who have been repeatedly accused of something. Would you like to talk about one of the, those coaches and what their history has been like? Um, one example is a guy by the name of James Bell. And James Bell was in three different states. And in every single state that he was in, every gym that he worked in, there were allegations of sexual abuse that followed him. And it would be reported to police, but maybe the family or the survivor would not want to prosecute. Or perhaps there wasn't enough evidence, and it was a he said, she said. But for whatever reason, he kept being able to move from gym to gym. USA Gymnastics allowed him to remain a member in good standing. And it wasn't until he moved to Rhode Island and abused um, more than half a dozen gymnasts there, that he was ultimately charged. He actually went on the run. He was a, um, on the most wanted list for a bit before he was finally arrested. But there are so many other people like that. Generally, in our investigation, we found that there were warning signs about many of these coaches before it would result in criminal charges. Ray Adams is another great example. He was another guy who had worked at more than half a dozen gyms. In every single gym, he was fired or forced to resign amid allegations of inappropriate contact with gymnasts. So um, this is an ongoing problem that is not just a problem for USA Gymnastics, but it's also a problem with the local gyms and the competitions and all of those sorts of places as well. Was there a specific age brackets for these survivors, like while uh, they were being, uh, while, while they were coaching with these coaches or while, while they were with these organizations? There isn't a specific demographic that the people were, the accused were targeting. You have children who are as young as six. You have, um, in Larry Nasser's case, some of the people that he sexually abused were adults. They were 22 or 24. So there there's a pretty wide range of ages when it comes to abuse. 
It's interesting that you say that because in 2014, I don't know if uh, some of us would remember that there was a female gymnast in India who had uh, filed a case of sexual harassment against two of her coaches. But when it actually, when she filed the case, there was a lot of, there was some conspiracy theory that was uh, floated and the Sports Authority of India chairperson said that because the complainant did not come and complain to us directly and has spoken to the media, there's no way we can take action about it. And like you were saying, in your investigation, you've also said that US Gymnastics specifically said that because the complaints did not come to them through the athletes, there was no way they could take it forward. So I, there is some kind of a universal pattern when it comes to bureaucracy and dismissing allegations of sexual harassment. But what would be very interesting if you tell us that in the states where you went to meet these people and found these cases, what is the specific law and what kind of mandate does an organization have when it comes to this and why do they not follow it? So what is the law and what in that case, what is the organization supposed to do and why is it dismissed? Well, let me first clarify one thing. So in a lot of the cases that we investigated, it was not the survivor themselves who reported it to USA Gymnastics. But there were some cases where the gymnast themselves did report it to USA Gymnastics, and they still did not pursue it. So that wasn't USA Gymnastics said they had a policy of a report having to be signed by a victim or a victim's parent. But even in some of those cases, they did not pursue it further, uh, according to the records that we have access to. Um, when you talk about what is the obligation of USA Gymnastics, almost every state in the United States, as I think I briefly mentioned earlier, has a mandatory reporting law. And in Indiana, as an example, that law requires that as soon as you have reason to believe a child is being abused or neglected, you must immediately report it to law enforcement. And there have been people who have prosec been prosecuted and convicted for waiting four hours. So immediately is a pretty significant word there. Um, not every state says immediately, but most say promptly or have some sort of statute or window that an authoritative figure must uh, report. Now, in Larry Nasser's case, as an example, uh, USA Gymnastics learned of the allegations against Larry Nasser, the team doctor, in 2015 and waited five weeks to report it to authorities. And in fact, during that five week period, they were doing their own investigation. They hired an investigator to look into it. And they also were giving excuses to team competitions for why he couldn't be there. So at one point, they had an agreement where they said, hey, why don't you say I'm sick? And USA Gymnastics told people he was sick and couldn't be there. So. Um, you know, it, it's not only about the time, but it's also about what is happening during that time period. So uh, coming to Larry Nasser, can you give us a, like a rough idea about uh, the, kind of, the, the kind of work he did for all those decades, the kind of influence he had with communities, with different organizations, with people in power, and then when you finally uh, exposed all these, uh, whatever he was up to, and the, came up with the testimonies, what was the reaction? Was there was a pushback? How did the people on the other end react? Just give us an idea uh, about how influential he was and how difficult it was to crack it. When we started investigating Larry Nasser, it's important to note he had not been criminally charged at that point. He was still working at Michigan State University. He had been team doctor for USA Gymnastics for four Olympic games for more than 20 years. He also was running for school board at the time that we started our investigation. So we're talking about somebody who is a pretty influential figure at the time. And so, you know, we're journalists. So it, it became really important for us to do everything that we could to try and verify the accounts of the survivors who were coming to us. And even with all of that, when we got to the point that we were ready to publish and felt comfortable with our findings and what we had, the reactions were really kind of mixed. There were, on one hand, you had members of the community that he lived in who were like, how could you say this about this amazing guy? And how he was this pillar of the community and how they were defending him and supporting him. But then at the same time, we had dozens of other survivors reaching out to us and saying he did the same thing to me. So we were kind of dealing with these two different reactions to our investigation into Larry as it came forward now. As I mentioned, we have more than 330 survivors who have come forward. But it really wasn't until he was charged with possession of child pornography that the 
people who were accusing us of being wrong kind of backed off. So it's kind of interesting because after this case in January 2018 now there was final, uh, he was brought to book and he's been given 175 years in prison? There are actually three different cases. There was a federal case and then two state court cases. Uh, the short version is he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison, barring any changes through appeal. But um, one of them was up to 175 years. There was 60 years in federal prison, which is the sentence he's serving now. And then there was another sentence, I think it was about like up to 145 years. So bottom line is he's probably not getting out. That's really great. I mean, that's the kind of impact your journalism had is kind of inspiring for all of us because it hardly happens. Uh, it's so r rare now. But I'll, uh, I'll come to Lali, uh, Larry Nasser in a bit, but I wanted to ask you, like, uh, like in 2010 in India, uh, several uh, women from the women's hockey team uh, complained against the coach. And that coach was fired at that point, but later on in 2014, he was given like a more uh, richer kind of a position where uh, basically there was no ramification. So I want to ask you that what is the difference when uh, something like this comes up? Uh, what kind of difference does it make to the complainant or the survivor and to the accused? So what is the uh, change? Because in your uh, investigation also you've written that lots of coaches who were convicted of molestation and stuff like that for a long time were still not on the banned list. So they continued to progress in their careers and this continued to do whatever they wanted to uh, compared to the survivors who have to live with that trauma and go through all of that. So what is the difference in terms of the ramifications of something like this coming out? Well, and I think that's so case specific. There's not sort of a generalized way to respond to that question because the consequences of their actions really depend on the individual and the individual situation. I mean, as I mentioned, Ray Adams had been forced to resign or fired from numerous gyms yet was still able to get jobs. And in some ways, gymnastics is a unique dynamic because a lot of gyms have trouble finding good coaches. And so when you have somebody who comes to you with six years of experience, and let's be real, nobody writes on their resume somebody that they think is going to be a reference with a bad review, right? So they use a parent from a former gym that still supported them despite what happened. And if there's no criminal conviction, there's nothing for the gym to find. And so in a lot of cases, you have people who are able to skirt under the system and continue to be involved with children. I think there's also no licensing component. So there's uh, been a lot of talk about the fact that a teacher, when they lose their teacher's license, maybe they go into um, coaching a sport because there is no licensing for being a coach. And so it's a way that they can still continue to interact with children, yet not face that sort of level of scrutiny. Uh, which brings me to another question because uh, it's also the kind of, uh, let's say, the kind of situations in which the media here is operating, it's kind of interesting for all of us who are practitioners or interested in Indian media should know that Indy Star also went to the court, to, uh, to, the, to a court in Georgia saying that we need access to certain documentations. Now, something like this, we had heard of, as journalists, we had heard of something like this happening like 15 years back or like some time back, till some time back, people used to feel file RTIs, which is a Right to Information Act, which we have under which we can access information. But now, uh, the, the scope to do that is kind of reducing. So, uh, or it's less and less, let's say that. So it's, it's good to know that Indie Star actually believed in what you were doing and agreed to go to the court. And so uh, tell us a bit about, did you have any kind of conflict with the, editor, uh, with the editors or with the management when you wanted to, when you, when you proposed something like this to access documents from the government? Or say, what kind of cost did it involve? Uh, tell us a bit about that. So let me start by saying that my bosses were incredibly supportive from day one. And I, I can't say that enough because, like I mentioned at the beginning, they paid for me to fly to Georgia the very same day that I found out about the USA Gymnastics case. And that's pretty unusual, even where I work. Um, and 
so I, I mentioned I'd picked up almost a thousand pages of records when I was in Georgia, but there were a bunch of other records we did not have access to. Specifically, USA Gymnastics kept a file, a dossier of files on coaches who had been accused of misconduct. So when I mentioned earlier that they would put it into a drawer, they actually had a file system where if they got allegations about somebody, they'd start compiling a file about them. And so we wanted to have access to those documents. The Gannett, who I work for, they own the Indianapolis Star, believe that that was in the public interest. And so in June of 2016, this is before our first piece in our investigation came out, the Indianapolis Star, through Gannett, filed a motion to intervene in that Georgia lawsuit, specifically to seek the judge to open access to those documents because they were in the public interest. And that fight took nine months and two trips to the Georgia Supreme Court before we were able to actually get access to those records. And even then, when we did get them, they were heavily redacted. But it required a huge investment on the part of my bosses because if they're paying for us to fly to Georgia to interview survivors, to um, intervene in this court case, those are resources that are being taken away from something else. And so it becomes really important to know that it's worth the investment that you're putting into it. It's great because I'm, I'm glad nobody told you to like m make four phone calls and write the story, which <laughs> happens. I've done those too. <laughs> <laughs> we all have. So uh, again, uh, coming back to Larry Nasser, like Me Too had a big, uh, there was a kind of association between the Me Too movement and Larry N uh, Nasser. So what, what was the connection? What is your take on the movement? Let's talk about that first. And what was the connection? How did it help take it further? So the Me Too movement in the United States happened, um, or I should say, our investigation came out both before, during, and after the major parts of the Me Too movement. So when we started our investigation, even the first stories about Larry Nassar, the movement hadn't really happened yet. Um, when it did happen, that's when you saw other survivors of Larry Nassar's coming forward more publicly. So we'd had a lot of survivors coming forward, but not all of them wanted to use their full name. But as that movement continued, more people wanted to share their full names. And that really continued until the sentencing that you mentioned that was in January of this year. And you had a lot of people who had only been known as Jane Doe AB or Jane Doe X who then said, no, I want my name to be out there. I want people to know what happened to me. Um, so I, I think, and, and this is true both as part of the movement and outside of it, is that in my experiences, I write about these sorts of issues a lot. And the more that they're written about, the more that people have a voice, the more people come forward. And it's because you're creating an environment where they feel comfortable sharing their experiences and what happened to them with, of course, the disclaimer that that doesn't mean that we as journalists are any less diligent about verifying facts. I always tell people when I'm talking to them that there's a difference between me believing what you're saying and what I can report. Those are two different standards. And so I may interview someone. There are people that we interviewed that we never wrote their stories in publication because they didn't read our, reach our threshold. And that doesn't mean that they're any less important or any less valuable. It just means that we couldn't do it. I mean, it's interesting uh, when you say that because there has been a lot of critique uh, elsewhere and in India when it comes to the Me Too movement. And it was uh, a lot of people have also said that our Me Too movement actually kind of uh, started when December 2012 anti-rape movement happened. And then thankfully, there was some space created to talk about sexual harassment and sexual violence. But there is. Uh, this, the, like you mentioned, there has been this critique when it comes to Me Too, there is no fact checking, or let's say the kind of degree of sexual misconduct is kind of gelled into one thing, so there is no separation. Or uh, in terms of attribution, it's a problem. So how do you deal with that critique? These stories, part of the reason that they're difficult to write about is because they're very difficult to prove. Because most of the times when sexual abuse happens, there's not a bunch of people in the room watching it happen, right? And so it becomes very, very difficult. But you do the best that you can. And when we're verifying, as an example, with the Larry Nasser case, 
we looked at every little detail to see if we could verify it. So as an example, one of the survivors told us that she had been abused during a world championships in China. So we looked, was the world championships in China the year that she said it was? Was she there? Was Larry Nasser there? Is there any indication that he saw her as a patient while he was there? And so verifying all of those little details to try and confirm. And the other thing that we did with that first story that we wrote was we're very careful to keep separations among survivors. And the survivors actually wanted to be connected kind of early on, but we weren't willing to do that because we wanted to hear their account in their own words and to see what was going on. And one of the things that we found when we did it that way was that the locations may have been different, the years may have been different, but that the way that it happened was almost exactly the same. No gloves, no one else in the room, no lubrication, um, none of the standards of medical practice that should have been used. So comparing what he was doing to what best practices are. So uh, there has been a lot of talk about due process it's also in India when it comes to Me Too. But uh, I, I was reading that in, uh, November, on November 15, 2017, there's a Me Too Congress Act that has been proposed with a specific, with like a, to address specific goals. So Me Too is all over, but what is the goal that they're trying to address? So they've, tried, they've said that through this act, they're going to talk about gender pay gap or say diversity or uh, how to deal with sexual harassment at workplace. So do you think this is kind of taking it forward? Is this the logical way to take a Me Too movement, for a movement like Me Too forward? Uh, as a journalist, how would you respond? Well, thankfully, I am paid to not have an opinion. So <laughs> I, I think it's an incredibly, I mean, you just referenced a bunch of things that are incredibly different mm -hmm. and incredibly complex. So I think conversations about these sorts of topics are really important, whether a Congress or an act or something like that will fix it. I think it's too early to tell. We would have to see what becomes law and then see the impact of the law. Because I know in my years as a reporter that not specific to the Me Too movement, but there have been plenty of times where there's a law that's created that is never prosecuted or never followed. And so the impact of that law doesn't fix what's going on. So why do you think, uh, again, you found like almost 500 cases now in, through this investigation, yeah. 500 survivors. So uh, what do you think is the reason for something like this so prevalent everywhere at such a large scale? Because I was, again, I found out that according to a 2016 uh, report, almost half of National Olympic Committees surveyed by, surveyed by the IOC have fewer than 20% of women on their executive bodies. And 10 countries don't have women at all on their bodies. And in, in India, it's worse because in the sports federations, women are between 2 to 8%. So they're hardly there. So do you think it's because women are not there in decision-making roles or higher up in the hierarchy to be able to take these things seriously and hold people accountable? Do you think it's because of this uh, disproportionate representation? Sexual abuse is a pervasive community problem that is not just in the sport of gymnastics. It's not just in the Olympic bodies. It's everywhere. So I, I think that um, what we found in our investigation is a systemic failure at every level of the system. So it wasn't just a United States Olympic Committee problem. It wasn't just a USA Gymnastics problem that the decisions that were being made, even at those local levels, at the local gyms with local coaches, had a pretty significant impact that continued up the chain. So I don't think you can point toward one thing as being the cause of, of the situation. I think it happens at every level, level and decisions that are made at every level. Okay, uh, which also brings me to the question that, uh, which is, uh, thank you, uh, which is that, was there any pushback after you came up with this expose? Were there people trolling you? Were there defamation lawsuits? Was uh, somebody upset in the organization, the management? Did they come and tell you, don't do this because we're not going to get funding or ads or stuff like that? Did, did something like that happen? Uh, I think it's fair to say USA Gymnastics was not happy with our report, the initial report that we did. They did issue a 
statement that said um, that they felt that we didn't tell the full story of their efforts on prevention. Um, but they pointed toward nothing that was inaccurate, nothing that was wrong. I mean, we were quoting from depositions from their own officials. So um, their pushback was really sort of a public perception issue. They never sued us or anything like that. Um, in fact, they hired a former federal prosecutor kind of in the wake of public scrutiny to examine their organization. And that former federal prosecutor confirmed all of the findings of our investigation. So they, their outside person hired by them found everything that we had produced was accurate. Um, so I, I think that, you know, anytime you're doing an investigation, uh, particularly when you're targeting an organization or an individual, there's going to be some pushback. But we were so diligent about the facts mm -hmm. that we weren't worried. I mean, we, to give you an idea of what the fact-checking process for an investigation like this was like, we would do, like, we would look up really simple words in the dictionary to make sure that we were using them in a way that we could back up. If somebody was like, how can you say the word many? What does the word many mean? We would look it up yeah. and we would say, okay, this does, this that we found matches that definition. And so we were so careful with every single word that we used because it was important that we get it right. So uh, were you not trolled? Were you not called a feminazi or something like that? You know, for I'm a little <laughs> disappointed, no. <laughs> I mean, now that you bring it up. <laughs> no. So what are you working now? Like, what is the next investigation that you're coming oh. um, I have two I, different... And I ask it very, like, uh, <laughs> what, uh, greedily in the sense that we, uh, now it's so difficult to do any kind of ground reporting because, or say investigative stories now any longer because it's, people want like five opinion pieces on the same thing, but not one story going out and <laughs> doing it. So. Yeah. Well, uh, a few things. So one is we're still working on USA Gymnastics. We're not done yet. So it's been more than, uh, it will be two years since the first story came out tomorrow wow. is our two year anniversary. Um, but we're still working on it. Yeah, thanks. Or maybe you should be giving me condolences. I'm not <laughs> sure. It's been a long road. But, um, you know, I, I have a couple other things that I'm doing that um, one is examining failures in a 1975 cold case um, involving three uh, girls then ages 11, 13, and 14 who were um, kidnapped. One of them was sexually abused. They were all stabbed and left for dead, but all three survived. Um, I'm also doing a uh, long-term narrative project on a young woman who entered the foster care system and all of the completely crazy things that happened to her since then. So um, like probably all of you, you're never working on just one thing uh, at the same time. We're all kind of juggling multiple things and um, you know, trying to move forward. <laughs> So I was uh, reading, uh, uh, again, one tidbit. I was reading that Marissa has won like more than 50 journalism awards. How does, this, how, how does that work? I don't <laughs> sleep, <laughs> basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've, I've been very lucky. <laughs> And uh, my last question before it, uh, before I open up, open it up to the uh, people sitting here, that uh, what is the role of, say, in the, all of us are living in a post-truth world where there is a lot of opinion, less facts, less figures. And especially here, we've seen a breakdown of, say, the desk in any news organization. There was a time when uh, a lot of us, when we joined journalism, there was a desk that used to fact check and give you feedback and uh, refine your ideas. But uh, now, because there is less and less of reporting on the ground, and there's more rehashing of, say, the ANI copies or the Reuters copies, and Lot, lots of opinion pieces. What is the importance of being part of an investigative team and to be able to take time enough to go out and do a story and corroborate it to an extent that there's an impact finally, something happens? What is the importance of it? Well, let me start by saying that the challenges that you're describing are happening in the United States as well. When I, the career, the industry is very different from when I started. And we, until a few years ago, had a copy desk as well that would fact check and would look at, you know, make sure everything was spelled right. And I, I think to answer it simply, I mean, it becomes 
more and more important that we get it right and we get it right the first time because you know no longer do we as journalists at least in where I work we don't have the same safety nets that we used to and so for me when I'm doing an investigation or I'm doing even a short-term story that's just about you know like a quick hit piece I'm still fact checking every single word every sentence every paragraph because at the end of the day it's my reputation and if I get something wrong then I'm eroding trust and so I think just continuing to get it right and work toward getting it right is you know the way that you try and work toward that trust and how many people do you have in your team and how long has it been there Tell on the investigative team yes. oh yeah we talked about this earlier. So, um, you know, something that a lot of people don't realize about our investigation. So when I joined the Indianapolis Star in 2013, I joined to be part of the investigative team. And um, about a year or two later, they did a reorganization and they got rid of the investigative team. And so I was still doing investigations, but by myself um, with no one else. And actually, during the USA Gymnastics piece, so I did kind of the initial work on the investigation. They brought in two other reporters, and we became a team. And it was maybe a year in that our bosses were like, yeah, you know, our Indie Star investigative team. And we're like, we have one of those? And they're like, yeah, it's you. So we basically worked ourselves back into an investigative team um, just by virtue of what we were doing, and we proved the value of what we could offer the organization. So now, that's a long answer to your question, but um, now we have three positions on the investigative team. So there are three people, me and two others, who do investigations full time. Thank you for creating that space. It means a lot to a lot of us here. So on that, that note, I'll open it up to the house. If you have any questions, please. Uh, let's take four questions at one time and then you can at one them. time <laughs> i don't know if i'll remember them you're gonna have to remember them for me <laughs> hello hi melissa could you uh shed some light on how the process of investigative journalism works like if you find a piece worthy of um investigating how do you go about it what are the checks and balances in your uh organization so, so some of that yeah, so uh, I start every investigation the same way. Um, we're, we all have limited amounts of time, right? We, we all have a million different things to do. And so story selection becomes a really, really important part of that process. And so any time that I get a tip about something, I get way more tips than I could ever possibly write about. Um, and so I always look at what is the minimum story and what is the maximum story. If the minimum story is important enough or the maximum story is important enough, I'll pursue it. But if you have a situation where there's not something that significant that's going on, but it's going to take a really long time to maybe get to where there's something bigger going on, you make a judgment call. And so with USA Gymnastics, what kind of the thought, using that as an example of that process, I knew from the very beginning that USA Gymnastics had a policy of not reporting all allegations to law enforcement. And I felt like that was an important enough story to pursue. And I knew that was the min minimum story that I had. Now, did I know that the maximum was going to be Larry Nasser and the breakdown of the organization? No, but I felt like that minimum story was important enough. And so kind of the process one is story evaluation. So you're deciding what you're going to pursue. And if it is worth the investment of resources, because we all have a finite amount of resources when we're looking at what we're going to dig into. Um, from there, it's about verifying as much information as we can. So, you know, in any story, um, somebody is telling you that this is true, but you still have to figure out if it is. And then, um, you know, constantly being, I always think defensively. So I'm always thinking, if I were opposing this, article or what this investigation found, how would I try and knock it down? How, what are the things that I would look at or look for to try and disprove what this person is saying or what this investigation has found thus far? And um, a really great example from the USA Gymnastics investigation was that um, when we had filed our motion to intervene in that Georgia lawsuit, USA Gymnastics filed a response that basically said we were on a witch hunt and that we're just highlighting all these old cases 
from decades ago that have nothing to do with the present. And so what that told us was the argument they were going to use and try and knock it down. And so it became really important to us in our investigation to be looking for those new cases to show that not only was this happening back then, but it's still happening today. And so that's kind of how the process in general works. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my question would be is to both of you, to Marissa and to Neha. Uh, I, I'm Devendra and I work with Save the Children. And yesterday, a uh, leading news channel in India, uh, CNN TV 18, did a story about uh, villages, whole villages in, in, a, in, a, in a state called Madhya Pradesh, where small children are, uh, you know, uh, are sold for prostitution. You know, and uh, at the whole uh, the whole day, the story was uh, just coming on the channel as, as an exclusive. So my question is that uh, you know, are crimes or uh, you know, uh, or abuse against women and children actually increasing, or has it been going on, uh, you know, from from time immemorial? And uh, it's just that the media is now catching those stories now. Hi, my question is that while reporting abuse, especially uh, in case of say in the LGBT community or of trans people, uh, how do you take care? of the language and how do you take care of the sensitivity because this is something that goes on especially in the Indian media that um, stories like this are reported very irresponsibly. So how do you take care of the language along with the facts? Thank you. Uh, hi, this is a question for both of you. Um, since your, you know, the investigation piece is sort of still running right now, I want to understand what was the kind of mental toll this investigation took on you personally. Um, and the same applies to Neha, because I know Neha has been in the center of being targeted forever online since her uh, piece for Outlook. Um, so what is the kind of um, sort of mental you know, impact this, these kind of reportage you know, investigative pieces do? And uh, is, it, um, is it very heavy on women? Um, or is the sort of mental impact the same for both genders? The first question was about, is it, has the crime increased against women or women, or is it being reported more? Well, I think the data that we've looked at, the broader data, shows that this has been a long-term ongoing problem. So I think that there's more media attention that is being focused on this topic um, based on the data that we have access to. But the other thing I would say to that is that sexual abuse historically is a very underreported crime. And so it's really hard to get a good grasp of exactly what's going on because for both Boys and girls, men and women, it's so underreported. And uh, the second question is about, uh, and I would just add to a thing that a lot of times, I remember when I had come to, uh, I, I grew up in Lucknow when I came to Delhi to study. All my family was like, Delhi is such an unsafe place. But actually for me as a young person coming to Delhi, it was far, I felt ma far more safer while I were, uh, compared to how it was in Lucknow. Because I feel that, uh, Thankfully, and also thankfully after the 2012 uh, incident, there is more space to report about it. So I think we've reached a point where these people are actually coming out and reporting these things, which wasn't getting any space in the media, or it used to get like a small column in newspapers each time there's a case of rape or sexual violence. I think now there is more space to talk about it, which is why we see more of this. Uh, and it's not... In fact, the numbers are, uh, it's not like it didn't used to happen earlier. So the numbers are pretty same, but now thankfully there's more reporting. Second question was about uh, how, how does one sensitize people when it comes to language uh, around uh, LGBT, uh, around talking about different genders, how, how does one, uh, how, what does one do about it to fix it? Yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, that same question comes up when you're writing about individuals who have disabilities or who have mental health diagnoses. The same questions come up. And I always am trying to make sure that the person that I'm writing about is comfortable with the language being used. So um, even within certain communities, the way that things are worded, there's not a universal agreement on how that's done that there may be some groups who want to say it a certain way and others want to say it a different way. So I generally tend to focus on the language of the people that I'm interviewing, what they're comfortable with, what they feel describes them accurately and in a way that they appreciate because it's their story. And so I think that um, it, it's most respectful to them to use you know, the wording that they're most comfortable with. 
does it take a mental toll on you, the kind of reporting you do? I think um, it could, for anybody who's reporting on these kind of topics, and, and you and I were talking a little bit about this earlier as well, but um, you know, for anyone who's reporting about trauma, whether it's sexual abuse or um, whether it's child deaths or crime or whatever the case may be, you have to have some sort of outlet that takes you away from that situation. And so I think for everybody it's a little different. And you asked about men versus women, and everyone feels that. Um, I did this investigation with two gentlemen, and they both struggled as well with writing about these topics and interviewing people about such sensitive things every day. It's just everybody's outlet is a little bit different. So like one of my colleagues, he would garden. I had another one who's in a rock band and he would play music. I would read or work out. You know, So everyone's outlet's a little different, but if you're a journalist, it's just really important to find an outlet that works for you. And um, that's you know to protect your long-term mental health because these are really difficult topics, as you know. For me, Padma, one is that uh, like each time you do a story, it kind of corrodes a bit of you. But when you, you talked about online trolling, initially, like four or five years back, it used to trouble me a lot. But now when you like every day see like poop pictures and pe pictures of people's private parts, I'm like, I'm not a doctor. I can't examine your poop, so I don't know why you're sending me this. But uh, and uh, initially, I used to respond and argue, but then I start started sending cat pictures and they're like, why, why are you sending me cat pictures? <laughs> so uh, I've become indifferent and unfortunately sometimes I feel that, uh, I hope I don't reach a point where, where I become completely indifferent to anything that's happening around me, but that's, that's the only way. And the one greatest thing is that a lot of you people, members support our support group sitting here. So we always come back to you and say, aaj ho hai. just like, tell me what to do about it. So it's like a mix of everything. It is a valid point, though. You do get, um, the more you write about topics like this, the more desensitized you do get to a certain degree. Um, you know, I remember early in my career when I was covering criminal courts that there were some cases where, like, I would go out to the car and I would cry in my car after because it was so horrible. But fast forward to where I'm at in my career now, and it, I mean, it would take a lot to really emotionally affect me just because of all of the things that I've had to see. More questions? Yeah. Uh, do you think you would be able to do such an investigation if you were a freelance writer or you did not have a newspaper backing you? And uh, second, uh, isn't um, investigations, aren't investigations being cut out all over the world, not just in India, in the US also? US newspapers are losing staff every day. We see it on Twitter. So investigations uh, cost and isn't it all coming down? Every media company is a little bit different. So actually, it's been interesting. In recent years, there's been actually a shift m toward more investigative journalism in a lot of companies. So Gannett, who I work for, yes, if you look at how many employees we have now versus how many we had five years ago, we have fewer than we did. But we also have more people on the ground. We have more reporters, and we have more resources directed toward investigations because they say that's one of their priorities. So there's definitely been a shift. Um, and, and I don't think that any organization has quite figured out the perfect you know, methodology for that yet. Um, and then could I do this as a freelancer? Actually, we were talking about that earlier as well, because um, I think it would be very difficult. And I don't mean because they wouldn't have filed the motion to intervene. I mean, we did most of our investigation without ever having those records. But I think that um, the amount of, you know, if you're a freelancer, you're thinking like time in versus like money out. And investigations are very difficult because they require a huge amount of time to get one story as opposed to doing like, the, as you said, like interviewing two or three or four sources and writing something. So I, do I think it's possible? Yes, but I think you'd have to probably supplement your income with something else to be able to do investigations like this as a freelancer. Earlier this year, probably by January, I forgot the name of the journalist, but there was this one person who was investigating into the crimes related to racism in America. So that guy went to a lot of states, especially those which had the highest percentage of people who believed in white supremacy. What he did was that he faked his identity in front of those people and saying that, yeah, I also believe in these ideas. 
and later he justified that because he said i did that i because i wanted to get the true side of what the events are and what happened my question is that just to even get to the root of the real problem is it ethical for an investigative journalist to go ahead and say slightly change the narrative of his identity because i can relate to the idea of how the first post uh, the cobra post incident happened uh, two or three months earlier where people are now even criticizing that specific journalist that whoever you were investigating confided to you in proper like trust that you earned their trust and then you went out in public and then humiliated them or whatever even it was for the right purpose so as an investigative journalist is it ethical for you to go and step outside that limit where you change your identity just to get to the root of the problem so uh, there's not a fully agreed upon code of ethics although the society of professional journalists does have a code of ethics that tends to be a, a pretty good general guideline um I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. Um, based on what you've just described, I don't know that case personally, so I don't really feel comfortable commenting specifically on that situation. But I think that um, there are individuals who will um, you know, immerse themselves into what they're reporting on. And I think that there are standards that go along with that to make sure that you're doing it the right way. I've never done that, so I'm probably not the best person to ask to be honest with you, but um, I guess I would just say more generally um, using caution when you're doing something like that. Because again, as journalists, all we have are our, our reputations, and so you want to make sure you're doing things in the right way. Great. Thank you. Uh, do we have time? No, we don't. So <laughs> We're being kicked out. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here, and uh, Marissa, may you do many such stories. May everybody sitting here do such stories more more in number and we look forward to it. Thank you for inspiring us and thank you for Thanks being here. Thanks for coming. Thank you guys. everyone.